wound up going from Utah State to where I am now, tell you a little bit more about the company, and then open it up to questions or whatever things you would like to talk about as well. So uh, I uh, grew up in North Logan, just a couple miles from here, and had no idea what I would do for a living. I still have a hard time explaining to people what I do for a living, uh, including my own family. I just visited with my mother and father, and they still are not sure what I do. My mother just says, oh, I know they put you in the job you're in because they figured out you're a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> and my father says, I can't believe they pay you that much to do human resources. Whatever you do, don't screw up this deal. <laughs> and uh, one of my sons came to me a few years ago because I'd always go traveling around the world and visiting different facilities and doing business reviews and so forth. And, and uh, I didn't have a lot to say about what I'd been doing. And so he and his little friends come up to me, and they're 12 or 13, and he says, Dad, I know what you do. And I go, you do? What, what do I do? And he said, and your secret's safe with my friends. We know you're really CIA. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me try to tell you a little bit about what I do. I had no clue growing up what I wanted to do. I had all kinds of blue-collar jobs, hauling hay and working in Del Monte factories and uh, picking fruit and everything you can think of. And, I didn't want to really do what my dad did because he was an accountant actually here at Utah State and this is in the before computer days and I'd visit him in his office and he'd have stacks of paper, these oversized binders and he's got an eraser and a pencil and a calculator. And I'm, what do you do? Well, this is what I do. What do you do all day though? Well, this is what I do. And so I thought, oh, that's got to be the worst job in the world, stuck in an office doing accounting. So I thought, I don't want to do accounting. And I came to Utah State for a year, took general ed. Uh, you didn't register by computer, you had to stand in line, and there were two lines, business administration and business education. I'm like, well, what's the difference? Well, the business education line is shorter, I'll get in that one. So I get in that one, I get up to the front, and then the little ladies at the table said, gosh, this is great, we never get men in this major. And I thought, okay, I've done, something's wrong here, I'm not sure what it is, and I switched over to the other one. And then I went on a, a two-year LDS mission for my church to North Carolina where I learned to speak Southern and then came back here to Utah State. And what I was good at was finance and accounting. But remember the story about my dad? I went, oh boy. And I, I did like working with people, so I started taking courses in both majors. And at the time, all my professors discouraged it. They thought that was a bad idea. Because they're like, well, what does one have to do with the other? You know, you're wasting time. And the finance and accounting professors were saying, this is what you're really good at. Why do you want to do the soft, fuzzy people stuff? And you can't make any money at that anyway. And the HR people were saying, what are you doing in finance and accounting? You're going to be a bean counter? No interaction with people locked in some room, you know? And uh, neither of them saw any value in it. And I didn't either. I just couldn't decide. So I went down both paths almost to the very end. And then I'm a few finance classes short of, have, of being a major in that, and I went the HR way. And then you don't always make your decisions based on the greatest things. And I went down in Salt Lake at this Mexican restaurant, and I saw this guy, and he had on his white shirt and tie, and he was sweating profusely and looked like he was all stressed out. And I sat and thought, there's a businessman. Oh, that looks horrible. You know, I don't want to be that guy. Fast forward 20 and 30 years, I don't want to be that guy. So I thought, what can I do that's not really just business? So I thought, I'll be a city manager. Yeah, city manager. You get to work with all these different departments and groups. So instead of getting an MBA, I got an MPA, thinking I'm going to be a city manager. So I went down to University of Utah for that. And I wound up taking half my classes with the MBA students and half with the political science. And to my dismay, I found I fit much better with the MBA students, just philosophy and how you look at things. And But it was too late. I was already committed. So I graduate. Um, it was not a great job market, but it wasn't a horrible one. But I couldn't get a job. I went six months. I, I got turned down a hundred times, I think, by everybody, even for jobs that were not even college graduate. I just, and I thought, I better go back and get an engineering degree or something. And then I got the first offer. And then once I got that, within two or three weeks, I had five other offers. So once somebody decided, oh, somebody's offered him a job, he must be okay, they all started offering me a job, but I had to choose between city management and HR. And for whatever reason, I'd never realized that you can be doing a great job in city management. As a matter of fact, you could be the best in the world at it, and you still get fired because they hold an election and the other party gets in office, and depending on how they're set up, they might let you go. And I thought, oh, I wish somebody would have told me that earlier. So I went the HR 
uh, way with AT&T in Albuquerque, New Mexico, big facility, Sandia Laboratories, 8,000 people. Um, I'd go back to meetings at AT&T and people would go, what do we do out there at Sandia? And I'd go, oh, you know, nuclear weapons research and development. What? We do what? So apparently AT&T decided it wasn't core to the mission to do nukes, so they got out of the business and sold it to Martin Marietta, which then became Lockheed Martin. And I said, either I'm going to stay for life or I'm going to go see the world. And I opted to go see the world, so I joined a privately held part of Toyota in Florida. They uh, still own that franchise in the five southeastern states. If you buy a vehicle, it's impossible to buy it from Toyota. You have to buy it from JM Family Enterprises. You just don't know that's what you're doing. Family owned, privately held. And then it was the dot-com era, and I had a chance to come back to Utah with a company that had just launched a new product called the Zip Drive. So I joined them, and we had 1,000 employees and a little over 100 million in revenue. 17 months later, we're a billion seven. We have 6,000 employees and two to 3,000 contractors. Going from 100 million to a billion in 17 months is what that took. It's faster than any company's ever done it in any industry still. That's twice as fast as Intel did it, twice as fast as Microsoft covered that distance. So it's just explosive growth. Uh, I was there four years. That put me in the top 15% for seniority. So people would go, how did we used to do it? And I was the source. Well, two years ago, this is what we did. And uh, I got a lot, of, a lot of learning out of how fast you have to move and how fast technology gets overtaken and how you got to do things differently than in a big company. And then a company, uh, Honeywell, started calling me. And uh, it was Allied Signal at the time. They called me for eight months every four weeks. Are you interested? Are you interested? No, I'm not. I'm happy. I'm happy. And then finally I decided maybe I Omega was going to have a problem. Uh, they hadn't started to drop off yet, but I could tell that I just didn't have confidence in the future. So I took the job with Honeywell in Kansas City at a big defense plant. Was there a year? Got moved to Phoenix, did half of their aerospace group for three and a half years, then the whole aerospace group, and then I've been in this job for the last two and a half. And as he said, I've got communications, internal, external, media stuff, Six Sigma. I've got our flight operations. Uh, we have 21 aircraft and 40 pilots. And so I run that because not only do we transport executives, but we test our own equipment on it. And then we uh, sell people stuff, take them up and say, it's kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of like uh, pimp my airplane. We've got all the top gadgets and gizmos and we take customers up and sell them. And then as of a week ago, I'm also now responsible for our global purchasing. So we buy $14 billion worth of stuff a year. And so I'm doing that in addition to the day job. So uh, that's my role and kind of how I got there. It wasn't, it wasn't all planned out. And I, I had no idea how significant it would be that I took as much finance and accounting as I did. That turned into a huge advantage for me because I could speak the language of the CEO. I understood the financial statements. And I could put everything we did in HR into, into financial terms, which is their language. So it turned into a, a nice advantage. A little bit about the company. We have four big groups. Aerospace is about $10 billion. It's about half of our profitability. Uh, if you get on an airplane anywhere in the world, made by anybody of any size, our stuff is on board. And more than a couple products. That's how I'm uh, legally allowed to say that one. So we've got some pretty significant stuff on board an airplane. It's mostly the guidance and navigation, the cockpit, uh, everything in there from the heating and the cooling, engines on business jets and smaller jets, a lot of mechanical components. Uh, we've got a significant defense business. Um, when you see, uh, in the old days, they used to just drop a bunch of bombs and hope something hit the target and there was collateral damage and so forth. And now we use precision things that find your door frame and where do you want it to go through the door frame from 20 miles away. No matter who makes the missile, there's one company in the world that makes the guidance in the nav. That's Honeywell. It's our stuff in the nose cone, figuring out where to put it. Uh, space program, every flight they've ever had that's had a person on board has had our guidance and navigation on it, including the one they're working on now. We've never caused a mission failure for NASA. We get them up and we get them back. Um, and then uh, we've got an automation control solutions business, which is now our biggest business. It's about $14 billion. And Honeywell is one of the biggest companies you're not sure what it is we do because we mostly sell to other businesses. But one product you're probably familiar with are... Uh, thermostats, the little round Honeywell, 
Uh, most, uh, there's a lot of makers of them, but Honeywell still ha makes most of those. That's half of 1% of our revenue. So it's actually, even though we're the big player, it's a small part of what we do. And we do uh, controls for all the oil refineries in the world, even those run by dictators and so forth. Um, we do fire systems, security systems, gas detection, personal protective equipment for fire departments and uh, all kinds of businesses as part of that ACS business. The third one is a chemicals business. Uh, the clothing you have on, you've got our product on. What makes the cloth a little tougher is a chemical that we sell. Uh, body armor that they use. When they were talking about we have the bad stuff, we need the good stuff in Iraq, uh, our stuff was the good stuff they were talking about. Uh, we do different refrigerants, uh, different kinds of chemicals, uh, the processes used in oil and gas refining. And then our fourth business, and that's about a $5 billion business, and then we have another $5 billion business in automotive. And we may be the only automotive suppliers that make money in the whole chain. And it's because like most of our stuff, we have a technology advantage. We sell uh, most of the world's turbochargers on vehicles. So 65% of what they drive in Europe has a Honeywell turbocharger on it. And that's, uh, you know, you, the engine can be a third of the size smaller, same power, and you use a fourth less fuel. So that's a huge business for us. And then we sell other products like Prestone, uh, Fram, Autolite, and Bendix brakes, for those of you that have heard of those. So that's kind of the business portfolio. And I know uh, this is an entrepreneurship class. And what's interesting is, so I'm part of this big company. And we have a lot of set processes about how we do things. We've also, in the last 10 years, done over 80 acquisitions. So a couple big $2 billion types. And we've done a lot of small ones, too. When we find a particular product, something that we're very interested in. So we've bought up a lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs, if you will. We've bought them out. And sometimes we keep them on, and sometimes we just keep them on for a little while, and sometimes we don't. It just depends. And one thing I'll mention is, uh, in terms of what sells, you, you've probably heard the expression, build a better mouse trap, and the world will beat a path to your door. Absolutely not true. Not true. I, I've got live examples where we've clearly built a better mouse trap, and the world doesn't beat a path to your door. For instance, biofuels, where people will use corn and other food stuff and convert it into fuel to be used. And the problem is it's kind of expensive, and it's competing with the food supply in the world. And so it kind of hasn't taken off. We have a product that it doesn't compete with the food supply. It uses algaes and weeds. And we've already proven it. And they've flown it on Continental Airlines, Japan Airlines. The military's ordered 600,000 gallons from us. We've had this proven and developed for over six years with no customer, and it's the same cost as refining petro, same cost as, as uh, the fossil fuels, and it doesn't compete with food stock, and more important, the problem with biofuels is it corrodes the pipelines. You've got to mix it with regular, regular fuel. You can put in about 10% bio and 90% fuel, or you'll corrode your engine and lines. Ours is a drop-in product. You don't blend it with anything. You just drop it in. Clearly, the cost is there. Uh, it's green, uh, and it's just as efficient. So how come the world hasn't beat a path to our door? I mean, it, it's just not true. Uh, another thing as an entrepreneur is people won't always pay for the better mousetrap. They, you've got to design something that people want. And the biggest problem, we have 20,000 engineers. One of the biggest problems we have with our engineers is they all want to invent stuff. Because indeed, we have invented st things. The, the thing that uh, the airplane automatically says, here are the other aircraft in the sky, go up, go down, that's us. That's a Honeywell invention, those sorts of things. So they want to come and invent stuff. They don't want to reuse things. They want to invent things. And sometimes they get so excited talking with the engineers of another company, can you make something that does this? Yeah, we can make something that does that. Can it do this too? Yeah. And pretty soon they build this product that gets so expensive and has all these extra cool features that no one's ever done, but people don't want to pay for it. Or you've made the product way too expensive. Uh, I'm going to give you one more example too before I open it up for questions. This example is about five years old. but. We had a, a pump that we made that's used on big uh, uh, on air conditioning units in uh, residence and commercial. And we were at one point the world leader. We had most of the market share for this particular device. And then our share started slipping. 
and competitors started overtaking us. So we're looking at it going, okay, it's on a demise curve. How can we, what, what's the problem? Why are we losing market share? Well, it must be the cost. These guys are beating us on price, so we, we need to lower our cost. So we lower our cost with the idea of picking up more volume, and you know what happened? The volume continued to drop. So now we're getting, taking less money in on this once dominant product, and uh, we're taking less money and our volume's gone down because we've lowered the price. So not the issue. Well, maybe it's the, how good the product is. Maybe the competitor has a better product. Guess what? They didn't. We had a superior technological product. And when we would talk to the people we were selling it to, they'd go, oh yeah, we'd much rather buy the Honeywell one. It's better than these other ones. And they'd go, why you buy the other ones? And they'd say, well, because that's what people are demanding. And so we're like, okay, we've got a technology advantage. It's not price. What could it possibly be? And a lot of times if you're an entrepreneur, you're thinking, well, we just need to invent another better mouse trap. Or you know what it was? The people we were selling it to were distributors. Who buys from the distributor? And who is it? Who, you think it's homeowners installing pumps in their air conditioning, you know? Think about how that goes. The air conditioning breaks, what do they do? They call up some company to come service it. They send a technician out. The technician comes out. He says, gee, your compressor's gone. Uh, I, I'll get you a new one. He doesn't say, would you like the Honeywell one or do you want one from this company or one from this company? The homeowner doesn't know. They don't care. So guess where the decision's getting made about which one to buy? It's the installer. Guess how the installer is making the decision. Think about this. If you're the installer, only if he's on commission, but most of them aren't. So he doesn't care. What? Close. Closer. Yeah, like if it breaks down faster, he gets paid more, but he puts it back down. Absolutely. So he doesn't care about the quality piece. And you know what the biggest factor was? Ease of installment. Because he could do it and be out of there with a competitor product like that, where ours was harder to install. It was a better product at as good or better price, but it took him longer to put it in. And so he was making the decision. What does he care? You know, he was making the decision on which one's the easiest to put in. And once we realized that, we redesigned, and this is a true story, we redesigned our pumps to make it easy to install. We jacked the price up, doubled the price, and we took back the market. I mean, that's just counterintuitive to what you would think about things, but, but it's because we finally figured out who's the real customer, who's making the decision. So were those uh, swamp killer pumps? Mm-hmm. That's what that, we're talking about swamp killer pumps. Yeah. Okay. I've, just, I've installed a bunch of them. Yeah, and so as the, yeah, you have. So as the installer, it's like, hey, what works? And if, if it breaks down, okay, so you come back and fix it or put one in and under warranty or whatever. But see, we didn't realize that. We were selling to distributors, and we were thinking it's all about who has the best pump, and then it must be about price. And... It wasn't about either of those. So some of what you're doing, it is important to have a great idea, but it's not enough. Even if you make the thing work and come to fruition, it's not like in the movies where people just all of a sudden buy it. So how did you root cause, uh, how did you what is your process of uh, doing market research or whatever it took to get anything? Well, the initial market research wasn't very helpful because it was just like, well, we don't know. The distributors, they're just, just what they're ordering. And when we talked to them, say, no, your pump's fine, and we don't know, it's just not as, I mean, they couldn't get to the bottom of it with market research. It was more when we started doing in-depth reviews of saying, okay, something's wrong here. What if, and we focused in on voice of the customer, but the, they were defining the customer as the distributor, because that's who we sold it to and who paid us. And after we got into it with more senior people looking at it, we said, wait a minute, they're not really making the, they're making a decision, but it's based on what these other guys are making, and it's not the homeowner either. For a while, they were talking to homeowners about it, and the homeowner's like, I don't care as long as it works and doesn't cost me a lot, you know. But it came down to that installer. And so once we knew that, then we talked to the installers, figured out what the issue was and how to fix it, and then we also realized we could raise the price too, and it wouldn't have any impact. So some of it is, yes, you got to have a, a bad products don't sell. Being in a bad industry doesn't work either. But we're actually in two bad industries. The difference is we have a technology advantage. We're in automotive, which is not a good industry. All three automakers combined have less market value than Honeywell does, even though they've got 
four times, the, five times the employees all put together. I mean, it's not a good industry. And the people that supply automotive, it's just ruthless. You know, they're, they're trying to get markup and margin on things. We have great margin on, on our turbochargers because we have a technology advantage. Uh, airlines is not a good business. It's not a good model. They're always losing money and uh, struggling to get by. But we have a great margin business. Ours is twice the average for an industrial margin there. Again, it's because we have a technology advantage with the advanced electronics and you probably know this, but planes can actually land themselves and take off by themselves now with equipment. And uh, we can absolutely guarantee that uh, something like what happened at the World Towers, we could make that physically impossible already with existing technology where the plane would take control away from a pilot trying to buy it into something, sense it, and veer off. But the pilots don't like that. They don't want to fly something where they think the computer is going to take over for them. So, uh, so you've got to think about who, who's really your customer, how do they really make buying decisions? And it's not always what they tell you either. You've really got to watch and pay attention to how they're making decisions. And then you've got to find a way to market what, what you have in a way that's meaningful to a customer. And you've got to be able, we spend a lot of time segmenting our market too. It's kind of like you've probably heard, the, I think it was the Purina company when they figured out the dog food thing. And there's everything from dog as a workhorse to dog as family pet to dog as grandchild. And people spend differently based on how they viewed their animals. And so that's how they then changed the food product too. And they knew they could charge higher margin when somebody views the dog as a grandchild, for example, than as a workhorse. We do the same thing with all of our markets. And we do it once a year. We sit down and have a review of every single business, like 70 or 80 businesses, and we go over their, their, how they've segmented their market to make sure we're getting, you know, why is this moving, why isn't this moving, that sort of thing. Questions? Yes? Would you say that your lifestyle at HP put in a 40-hour work week, or are you more like an 80 or 90-hour work week based on your mother's sensibility? Well, it's not a 40. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's uh, 80. It's kind of hard to because I travel about 30, 35 percent of the time. Last two weeks, I've been in India, China, Nepal, uh, Japan. Uh, two weeks before that, South Africa, Egypt, Nigeria. So I do a lot of travel to our businesses and to customers to help drum up business. But I also have stretches where I'm at home and have some control over my schedule. I, I'd probably guess uh, I probably put in 55 hours plus BlackBerry time, which is 7.24. Even getting called on holidays sometimes. Oh my gosh, something's happened, and you know, put the turkey down and take care of it. And so I'm kind of on demand, that comes with the job. But I will say I have four children, uh, ranging from 12 to 22, and uh, I made it to most of their activities, whether it's a sporting event in the middle of the day, or uh, something that they're putting on. Once in a while I've had to miss because I was overseas, but I probably made 80% of their stuff that matters. Um, but what that means is I don't play on softball teams, I don't go golfing. I, it's like work or family, uh, and that's how I have to fit it in. So it's a challenge, and I wish I was home more, um, but I think I've been able to, to balance it better than maybe if I just let the schedule take control. Uh, I will tell you that uh, there's very, there are very few places that you're going to be able to work 40 hours. Uh, no offense intended, but uh, government might be the only place, and it doesn't pay that well. Uh, and promotion's tough because they, they have a hard time firing people usually, so things don't open up unless someone dies or retires. And that's a trade-off you make. It's kind of a more of a job security uh, sort of a thing. Uh, but in competitive companies, there, there aren't 40 hour a week jobs anymore. There just aren't. And if you're looking at it, if you were the business owner, um, who would you hire? The expensive person who's gonna work 40.0 and no matter what's going on, they're gonna walk out the door at 5.00? Or are you gonna hire the person that's gonna put in 60 hours and cost less because they're earlier in their career and they're more enthusiastic? Which person are you gonna have on your payroll? That's the trade-off businesses make every day. And so it's great to make a lot of money, but you also become, hmm, costs a lot more to employ this person. Wow, this person seems just as good. They work harder and they cost less. And that's kind of a reality of the workplace. Mark, could you uh, share the story you told us at lunchtime today about the analysis that your firm did in thinking about the top students who worked out and those who didn't? 
Oh, okay, so uh, we have a marketing and business development function. And what we do, we hire people from uh, Harvard, MIT, Cornell, a lot of the Ivy League schools, and they've, they've usually uh, uh, worked at McKinsey as a consultant, and they come in with a terrific background and close to perfect scores on SAT, and we'll bring them into our corporate group, and we keep them in there 12 to 18 months, kind of learn the ropes, learn the businesses, and then we send them out into one of the business units to help drive marketing and strategy for them. And we were having this phenomenon where they were either wildly successful, businesses loved them, they were turning unprofitable things profitable, or we fired them. And there was nobody in between. It was nobody where, oh, they're okay, you know, nobody. They were either a star or they got fired. And so my boss said, what's going on? I mean, we're getting people with similar backgrounds. They're all very smart. Even the people getting fired are very smart. What is the difference? And so we had all these theories about what it might be. And I said, well, let me use data. And I got a statistician in our company. And I said, we're going to look at all kinds of factors in these folks' background and try to figure out what's the difference? Why is it such a goats and sheep thing? And so we ran all kinds of things. And only one thing correlated. And it was an absolutely perfect correlation over looking at five years worth of doing this. Perfect correlation, no exceptions. Any, any ideas on what it was? It was something in common in the background of those who succeeded and something in common of those who didn't. All smart people with great backgrounds. It was who'd had crappy work before. Blue collar, hourly, hauled hay, worked in a factory, military, anybody that had been in the military where your will is not your own, give me a hundred and do this and do that and trudge through the mud and uh, people that had worked construction roles, and as long as they had something like that in their background, they were successful. And every single person who didn't have that, they were born into a wealthy family in the Northeast, went to the finest schools, may have had a job, but it was like summer lifeguard at the pool or something, um, that sort of thing. Those were the people that failed every single time. And so as you think about why, why is that, it was kind of easy to figure it out. The difference was the people who had done crappy work before, they came in with willing to work hard and knowing that you're not really entitled to stuff. No matter how great your background is, you can get fired on the spot. Uh, you know. and, and so when you'd say to them out in the business, how do we fix this? And they'd go, oh, dig three trenches that way and one that way. Um, the, the people who hadn't had the blue collar background at all, they would go, yeah, okay, well, my work's done here. And if it doesn't work out, it's because you guys didn't do what I told you to. you know." And uh, uh, I don't do windows, basically. Where the other people would go, okay, it's three trenches this way, one trench this way. Let me get in and help you on this first trench. Let me get down in the weeds on this thing and help you sort through it. Because it didn't matter to them that they were doing something beneath them. So an example would be like, I might work on an acquisition in the morning. Should we buy a company? I got to coach an executive in the afternoon. And then my boss might say, hey, we're cutting back on cost. We got rid of the custodial staff, so take your garbage can out at the end of the day. To me, I'd be like, okay, I still get paid the same anyway, no big deal, takes me a few minutes. But there are people in the workplace who will go, take my garbage out? That's demeaning. I didn't, I didn't put in all this time and effort to do something lowly like that. And so that was our learning, and so now it's an absolute screen. When we look at people to bring them into marketing and BD, if they do not have military or some kind of blue collar experience, we've learned to pass. Some of it is, it's attitude. It, it was never about brains. Not a, one of those people that got fired got fired for brains. And as a matter of fact, I've probably been involved in maybe 200 executives that have lost their jobs. I can think of one guy that lost it based on competence. It's, it's attitude is why people wind up losing their job. They, we call it smartest guy in the room syndrome. No, no matter what their background is, not only do they know how to do their job, they know how to do your job better than you. And they're willing to argue to the death to be to be right about it. And that, that alienates somebody when they go out in a business and say, oh, your marketing strategy is all, how you're trying to push this product's all wrong. And you guys are idiots and here's how it ought to be. And they won't entertain any kind of an argument back or a, you don't understand or, you know, and they're just all arrogant about it versus someone who gets in and tries to understand, okay, why do you think I'm wrong? Let's talk this, okay, got a point there, still disagree with you there. Those are the people that are more helpful. So you can't be dumb and succeed, but being smart if you think you're the smartest, it becomes a real liability in the workplace, small company or big company, and you'll make really bad decisions and charge right off the cliff with everybody 
right behind you, convinced, you know, that you're right. So, yeah, a lot of it is, it's headset and attitude and being willing to look at something differently. And it's really hard if it's your product or your idea. It's hard to separate from it. When we do acquisitions, I don't think I mentioned this in here. Uh, we looked at, at uh, acquisitions just from a financial standpoint. Here's how much we paid for it. So here's how much money we've made off it. Did we make money or did we lose money or did we break even? So ignore the economy or anything else. Just d d was it a successful one? The, the success rate, if you just put a financial measure on it for most companies, is somewhere between 25 and 35 percent. When we looked at our acquisitions, and we'd done over 40 of them in the five to 10 years ago category, we had a 25% success rate. We were just as bad as everybody else and maybe worse. The 40 plus we've done in the last five years, 82% success, including recession data. Wow, what a turnaround. What's the difference? As a matter of fact, the Wall Street analysts now point to Honeywell and say one of the best acquirers out there, where we were one of the worst. Couple things. Number one, we don't let people count sales synergies. What that means is people will fall in love with a technology, with some company they want to buy, and it'll grow their empire underneath them. And so all of a sudden, they just got to have that at any price. And they'll say, look, if we buy this, I can sell all these existing products through them to their customers. And we can take some of their products and sell them back through ours. And so one plus one equals three. And they build it into the model. Therefore, they're willing to pay a lot more for it. And they overpay. Most companies overpay for their acquisitions. And that's how it happens, is people fall in love with the deal. So we say, you can't count it. We don't care how sure you are, there's a sales synergy, you can't count it when we evaluate, and we walk away from deals all the time. Uh, to be honest, we, we do one in 100 deals that we look at. We walk away when the price gets too high. So everything we buy, we're starting in a great spot. Uh, the second thing, we got smarter about what we pick. Okay, we don't pick commodities. We pick places where it's mostly companies you haven't heard of making stuff, and there's 20 different companies making the product, so nobody really dominates it. And we come in as a big company with a lot of structure and some know-how, and it, it lets us quickly grab up market share, buy into it, and then basically outperform everybody else there. Those are the ones we love. So that's why we bought things like firefighter gear. Who would think of that, you know? But guess what? There's only a couple people that make it, and you charge a lot of money for it because it's highly, you can't have it melting and things like that. That was a great acquisition for us. Um, gas detection, hugely profitable. And there were like 20 different companies providing it. We're the only big one doing it, and we're now the world's leader in less than a year in gas detection around the globe. So we pick great positions in, in, in good industries, and we we're better at it. And the third one, and maybe the biggest one, is the way we do integration. It's different than how every other company does it. Um, we do, our CEO and chairman, even on the small deals, he does, depending on how early we start talking to him, 180 day review before the deal, 90 days, 60 days, 30 days, a review at the deal, a review 30 days after, 60, 90, 180, 360. Your integration team and the business leaders have to come in and explain what they're doing. And the CEO says, do this, look into that, do that. Well, guess what? They're not going to come back in 30 days and go, oh, well, we didn't really do it. We were kind of busy. I mean, that's a career-defining moment. And so guess what happens? We're darn good at integration because everything happens because people know they have to keep accounting out for it. And so we've gotten much better at where before you would have had one or two reviews and then you just see how the business does. That's how most companies do it. So that's what's made us a better acquirer. Who charts the uh, to-dos? Who keeps track of that? Do this, do that, and then when the next review comes, uh, you, you have a follow-up. Is that someone in your office doing that? Or um, not that works for me, but it's part of our strategy group. And yeah. we, we use a, we've gotten smart about use a checklist. Don't make everybody reinvent everything. We know that in deals, here's 400 things you have to make sure you've looked at so you don't get surprised by anything. And so they go through, we go through that checklist and that deck each time we meet with them. And they identify anything that's not moving. Or, and it lets him question the way we're doing things, too. And so it creates this accountability where when you're the integration leader, you've got to make darn sure you're prepared every 30 days, which means you're going to do all kinds of things you may not have done if no one ever asked you about it or asked you if you did it. 
And so that's made us a much better integrator too. Yes. Who is the CEO accountable to? I know you got a shareholder in, in that, but does he account to say do this, do that? Does he take on any assignments and is somebody that you have to report back to the integration leader? Mostly he gives assignments. <laughs> and anything that remotely involves a person becomes my action item. Oh, there's people involved. That's yours, Mark. But uh, he, no, he mostly gives them out. Who he's accountable to is the board of directors. So we have an independent board of directors. He's the only one that's an employee and a member of the board. He's also the chairman. Uh, so we have uh, board members, and he has to report out to them. They have to approve any acquisitions you do of a certain amount. To, is this a good thing for shareholders or not? And do we authorize you to go forward with them? And then we report back out to them, not as, not as many, but we do, a, we do a before we want to buy it, when we want approval to go commit funds, and then when we're going to buy it, we meet with the board again, and then we meet with them uh, after, it's six months after, to show if it's doing what we said it would which is actually a plus when you're good at it because then the board gets confidence in you, where when you blow it, they feel like you're wasting money. So I, I'm a kind of a family-oriented person. So you said that you make 80% of the things that you, you, know, you get to for your kids and things like that. What do you do to make sure that that happens? Because obviously you've got a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my year actually gets planned out in advance. I've got meetings I have to do with the board. I'm responsible for the committee that decides how much to pay everybody and that sort of thing. So a lot of things are pre-programmed in, and it lets me schedule things around it. But I'll go in the middle of the day. I just block it out. I get, okay, so my kid makes a sports team, and I get his schedule. And the games start at 2.30 or 3, and I just put it in there. And uh, I just make sure that I always get everything done. And so my boss isn't sure whether I'm there or not there. He doesn't care as long as when I calls, I'm there. And sometimes he'll call me in the middle of the game and I have to step out and deal with something. So it's about the results you deliver. I couldn't just go, oh, hey, sorry, boss. I've had this on here for six months and it's my son, so I can't talk to you. You know, you got to be flexible. But if I didn't pre-plan it and wire it into my calendar, it would never happen. I, I think I'd make 10% of their stuff because there's always something important or always some issue. But for me, it's a priority, and I made room for it by carving out other things. I used to play on softball and basketball teams, and I just can't do that anymore, not once I had kids and they got older. I, everybody has to make those kind of choices. And I just didn't want to be the executive who maybe got wealthy, but you, you die alone sort of thing. Uh, nor did I want to just be such the family guy, but, but my finances are always a struggle. You always get the bill collectors calling. And, so everybody has to find their own balance and what's important. And when it's a kid's activity, is it a, some of you have probably heard, I, I don't remember where it came from, but is it a glass ball or a rubber ball sort of thing? Is it something you can drop and pick back up again? Or is it something you drop and it shatters? You can't pick it back up any again. And it'd be so important to your kid that if you weren't there, they would never forget that you weren't there. Then that's got to move up in your priority. Or if it's something else where they you know, don't really want that big deal to them, then they understand. I'm sure they wish I was around more, like all the time. And it's always a struggle. And the world's become more and more competitive. And it, no longer do things shut down. Everybody expects you to be 7 by 24. We have work we pass around the globe. It never gets stopped worked on it. Software programming, we have 8,000 software engineers in India. And so, you know, they're, they're almost a half day off from us. And so we pass work back and forth. Our guys will work on it in Phoenix. Those guys will pick it up on that, that part of the day. Then the Phoenix guys pick it back up. And I mean, it's just a competitive world. So to come in and say, well, I'm not going to do that. Anybody know how many hours the Chinese work a week? 160. <laughs> Seems like it. And a lot of people are like, oh, well, it's mostly rice patties. And they're still, they got their problems. I don't know if any of you have been there. Anybody been to Shanghai? You'll, you'll be, I don't know what the right word is. Shock and awe. Shock and awe. That's what I'd describe it. Shock and awe. It is not a backward nation. They're way hungrier than Americans. Um, we've gotten a little passive with our, it's like a winning team that gets a little passive. We have no idea how good they are and how hard they work and what entrepreneurs they are. Even the, even the street people trying to sell you stuff, they're so aggressive. They hang on your arm and cut you all kinds of deals. And, and here you go into a store and you're lucky to get somebody to wait on you, okay? Maybe not Logan, but in a lot of places. And, and you're just shocked. You're shocked at the newness of the buildings, the, how many skyscrapers they have, cranes all over the city. Uh, they've decided to do this, and they get it done. Our, our shovel-ready economic recovery, some of the money's just now getting there. 
China's was ready that week. They give it out on Tuesday and they're breaking dirt on Thursday. I mean, people don't realize how fast they're coming up on, on us until you see it. And think about if you're a business person, and this is real life stuff. So I can be sitting in Phoenix and we've got an aerospace engineer who thinks he has a pretty unique skill set because there's only two places in the world that have it, uh, which is mostly true. And uh, he's making, you know, 120, 130,000 a year. And he's upset because you've changed some little policy. And he really wants, uh, he's upset that it, the merit raise isn't bigger because he wants to third garage and wants to put in a pool. And he's not going to work over 40 hours a week because you used to pay him overtime for it. And now you won't. And you go, you get on a plane and you go from there and you go over to Bangalore, India. And uh, you've got eight guys, which is the same pay equivalent as what you're paying him and they're begging you for more work to do, and they're working six days a week, and when you give them work that the other guy's doing, world class, only done a couple places, the first three months, they're like, oh, the India guys, they'll never, they've never even flown an airplane, how can they program for it? They'll never figure this out. Well, tough, keep working with them. Six months, well, they're doing a little better, but only because we're over there helping them figure it out. Nine months, oh yeah, they, they've really gotten a lot better. 12 months? product's better than what our guys were doing. I see that over and over and over again. They can't do it. They don't have the capability. And within a year, they're killing you on it. And so, I mean, there's just such a competitiveness that for us to sit here and say, well, um, I really don't, I, I got to work just to put some food on the table and I'm not going to work any extra. You're going to have trouble keeping your job, not just in the U.S., but with how hungry some of these countries are and coming up so fast on Technology will make your head spin around. I'm not trying to turn everybody into a workaholic. I'm just <laughs> trying to say, I mean, that's the reality of it. And you get a BlackBerry, what a great device, what a time-saving device, uh-huh, right. <laughs> you know, I get 100 messages a day, and people call you if you don't respond within an hour. Where are you? <laughs> what is the hiring process like? I mean, do you have to know somebody inside? What do you have to do? Do you have to have an MBA, as you say, to get into the it's kind of an all of the above thing. I mean, we post a bunch of jobs on a Honeywell site around the world, and they all have different requirements of what we want. So if it's an HR job, we tend to hire master's degrees, MBAs, or uh, master's in human resources. If it's into the finance and accounting organization, we tend to hire bachelors, not masters. It's just been the, our experience has been what we want a lot of them to do. Uh, we do better with the bachelor degree folks than we do with some of the MBAs. So that's why I say it depends on what it is. If you know people, that always helps, but you still gotta be able to uh, sell yourself because you wind up, no, no one person can just hire somebody. Right. So it's a variety. Do you have any entrepreneurship degrees? Because that's kind of a higher higher you know? No, um, we've had, uh, and this is just one thing to be aware of, all jobs have their ups and downs or pluses and minuses. There's pluses and minuses to working in a big company. The pluses are, Lots of money, basically. We can afford to dally around in some stuff, and it's not really a, much of a big deal. Um, and so you can experiment with a lot of stuff, and you have a lot of funding. And in a multi-industry one like ours, it's rare that every industry is down at the same time. We're a single industry company. It's fun when the ride's up, but it comes down pretty fast. So our businesses offset each other. Uh, we've got more advanced ways of doing things, process, structure, that sort of thing. Negatives? you don't have a lot of freedom to do what, just what you want because you're, not, you're gonna fit into the system. We've got a system, we've learned it works, you're gonna use this when you're doing that. And so you know, you're kinda like, well, but I have a better idea, and sometimes that can get snuffed out. If you have a great idea, but you can't prove the financials of it, you're not gonna get funded either. Where if you were your own person, you could, you could bet the farm on it, so to speak. Uh, and then there's going to be more bureaucracy in any big organization. People that have to approve this and approve that, and somebody won't let you hire people. And so there are pluses and minuses. And as you probably know in the entrepreneurial world, I know a significant number of people that have left us to go do an entrepreneurial startup. And there's some that are successful, like uh, you've heard of Garmin. Those were our guys that got their funding cut out in Olathe, Kansas. Uh, 15, 16 years ago, part of our general aviation program, and they went right across the street. That's why it's headquartered there. Uh, three guys working on a project, and they decided it wasn't going to come to fruition, so they cut their funding. 
and they were upset about it. So one guy took his inheritance and they resigned and went across the street and started up a little garage type operation and it's what you know as Garmin today. It came from uh, aircraft technology, whether it's the fish finder or the GPS or whatever. So that was an example of something that a big company snuffed out that we shouldn't have that turned into a huge business. On the other hand, we, we'd actually looked at that a couple of times, <laughs> whether that would be a good idea to buy them or not, because then they started, then they decided not only are handhelds and fish finders good, but maybe we can do uh, general aviation stuff, and they started coming their way up the chain, so we had to make a decision about how to, how to compete with them on the lower end of things. Um, but that's an example of something where the big company made the wrong decision, snuffed it out, it turned into a hugely profitable business. On the other hand, Nine out of ten people that leave us to go pursue something entrepreneurial, they're back in three to five years asking if they can come back. Um, because it's one thing to be your own boss and do something cool. It's another thing if you don't like being a salesperson, because that's what you are. Even if you hire a salesperson, they want to meet the big person before they're going to put down much of a deal with you. You wind up as a salesperson, and a lot of people didn't bargain for that. They want to get away from the bureaucracy. and. You know, but, and then the other thing is, is, is some things in a big company you take for granted, structure around you, and all of a sudden it's not there. You're it. You're everything. And now you get in trouble with wage and employment laws because you didn't know you were supposed to do this, and you hired the wrong bookkeeper, and somebody hosed up your payroll, and, and then the business goes dry, or there's a recession like this. I can't tell you how many consultants beg for jobs almost on a daily basis. So there's some where they're extremely successful, best move they ever made, and they're their own person and they become wealthy, but most of them it's like not what they thought it was gonna be, and it's pretty tough when you don't have a paycheck coming in either on a regular basis. And a lot of people come up with great ideas, but they're not the ones that profit from it. We, okay, I'll try not to be too political here, but one of the worries in China is the intellectual property. They'll steal your stuff, knock it off, and sell it. You put in all the R&D money, they sell it for profit. And by the way, they're faster and better than you, and they take your market. And that's a reality. That is what happens. Um, so people will say, well, we shouldn't even... Uh, we shouldn't even go there and, and do that sort of thing. But what's interesting is now the Chinese are inventing things. And guess what they're getting upset about? People are knocking off their intellectual property and it's becoming more and more of an issue. And uh, uh, so there, there are just a lot of pluses and minuses if you're gonna be an entrepreneur or a consultant. And you can come up with something great, but that doesn't mean it's gonna sell. And by the way, Americans have been successful because basically our execution on things. We say we've invented a lot of things. Start listing down the things we've invented and what you'll find is about 80% of them actually originated out of Europe. Somebody over there invented it. We operationalized it. A lot of the things that we think we did that we're famous for, when you go back, we're not the ones that actually came up with it. It was some British guy over in the UK but he couldn't figure out how to make a go of it and we wound up doing that. So you just want to go in with eyes open into that sort of thing. It's great if you can be your own boss and make good money, but you don't want to get in and get surprised and not have any money coming in and you have a great idea, but you can't seem to sell it to anybody. Like the fuel thing I mentioned earlier, sounds terrific, but wow, it's been a hard sell. I think we're out of, are we out of time or? Yeah, I think that's okay. What we'll do is, we'll, if it's all right with you, Mark, is we'll uh, move it upstairs. Okay. But uh, we'd like to give uh, Mark a Thank you. Okay. That was just terrific. Great presentation. I hope I hope our audio worked good because I, I really do want to put this on the on the website.